Hello everyone, today is Thursday, March 10th, 2022, and this is the week in charts. I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending. Looks like the numbers continue to climb, and I appreciate that. If you are watching the recording of the show on YouTube or my website, and you like to and you like to attend live, usually on Thursdays I have a banner ad up on my website, www.daveleonard.com or www daveleonard.com slash webinar. Register even if the link is old and you'll be registered hopefully forever. So what are we talk about? Well, obviously the elephant in the room is current market conditions, your questions on trading, your favorite stock and crypto picks. I don't know if you'll have a lot of crypto this week, but we'll touch upon crypto. Just put a dollar sign in front of anything that's crypto. And if you want me to take a look at individual stocks, put the stop ticker and then hit return that way i can delete it after we cover it so what are we going to focus on well i want to talk about surviving tough times and this kind of also dovetails in with surviving a drawdown and i want to speak to the the trader and the buy and hope person who hopefully won't be buying hope forever that'll make a lot more sense in a minute this is claim screen as you know you can lose money trading or as I often say all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Barring a line from my buddy Greg Morris. All right, let's talk about surviving tough times. Well, the first question you need to ask, this is probably the second question, but work with me, is what's changed in the markets? And notice the volatility, and this is historical volatility, was down around nine and change, or had a nine handle back in September. And notice where the historical volatility is now. Now, I don't know if you can see this on your screen. This is the 50-day HV. I do have the formula for Metastock and Telechart. If you need that, it's under members resources. But this is Landry volatility in the ACP package, which they put my name on it, but it's just historical volatility. Anyway, notice that historical volatility has jumped over 200%. So this is a completely different beast that we dealing that we are dealing with now compared to where we were just a few months ago. So that's changed for one. If you're wondering why you're getting knocked out and jerked around, well, markets in general are going to require a much, 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 much wider stop. We try to trade e minis and damn, it seems like you need about a 40 point stop <laughs> if you're going to try to hang on for most of the day. The other thing is the nature of the market is changing and that is starting to look like a bear. Now, on uh, February 23rd, if memory serves, yeah, I put this out right on the close, put up a, a quick post. As of the close on 223.22, we have a 10% TFM 10% sell signal. And the S P 500. Okay, so this was a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago, four weeks ago. Now, one thing that I did point out in the Facebook group on subsequent days, and I think it was on this bar here, is that the market did rally back above. Now, remember, if you dip below it, it's not an official signal, but if you close below it, it's an official signal. If you also close below the 50 week moving average, simple moving average which we're gonna get into in a few minutes. I know you, you, you wanna party with me, <laughs> specifically specifically Landry Live. But grabbing this snapshot from earlier today, we were below that 10% line. This is 428956 for those keeping score. Now, on, I think it was Wednesday of this week, we closed below it and I consider that an official signal. Now, back testing I did was based on a calendar week but the reason I took the signal on a Wednesday was a lot of stuff can, a lot of bad stuff can happen between Wednesday and Friday, is the way I kind of looked at it. So the testing kind of proved what my theory was in this, but my intent was to get out when you're 10% or more below. Now, I don't know if this sell signal back here in January was a daily sell, was a, I keep calling it a daily, was a, rolling sell signal like did it trigger on a tuesday or a wednesday or a thursday or even a monday 
But the following week, you can see there's no question it did close below the moving average. So the following week was both a calendar and a rolling chart. So to those who don't know what that is, a weekly chart is five trading days, Monday through Friday, obviously. And in some charting packages, it uses a rolling week, okay? So if you're looking at Monday, it's Monday, Monday to Monday, Tuesday, it's Tuesday to Tuesday, and so on and so forth. In other packages, it's a calendar week. And I think somebody, Sean, I believe in the group, confirmed that Metastock is a calendar week. I think ACP from Stock Charts is also a calendar week. But anyway, so as of today, which is Thursday, we did have a sell signal again, okay, on a rolling basis. So tomorrow, any close below on a Friday, below 4289, would make it officially official, okay? Is that a weekly bow tie in S&P today? Oh, good point. I didn't think to look at that. Let's take a look at that in a minute, John. Good point. Thanks for bringing that up. Now, one thing I want to point out in the fact that not only volatility went up, okay, but bear markets are different than bull markets. And a bull market is like the little guy on the prices, right? You know, do, 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 just kind of working his way up, the little mountaineer, you know? <laughs> and then bear markets are... But they're not quite that. Although they feel like a route, especially if you're buying hold type, there is a lot of fits and starts along the way and retraces that make you nuts. We had three shorts, two of them failed miserably, and one of them hit the IPT and then stopped out. So overall, if you're looking at the shorts of my service, you're probably not that impressed. And that's kind of par for the course until and unless we get into a more, God forbid, extended bear market where things just kind of trade slightly more orderly to the downside. Be careful if you are a buy and hold type of person. I want to touch upon perception in a minute because we've been talking a lot about that. Beware that there's going to be the mother of all bounces here and there, but that doesn't not that doesn't mean it's the all clear. Now, when I was digging around for slides, I came across this one, and I thought it's important to talk about it once again. The six most dangerous words on Wall Street, but it was working so well. And I'm as guilty as anyone of this, and I think initially I was inspired to put this in some slides a while back when one of you guys who is a little bit more of a of a scalper type you you trade the longer term trends and you trade the service really well better than me in a lot of cases <laughs> truth be told but uh you also tend to scalp a little bit as time allows and you absolutely print money doing it but i think in this particular case we had just the opposite thing happen he was scalping scalping making money printing money printing money printing money and then all of a sudden the volatility dried up and he told me it was working so well. So those are the six most dangerous words on Wall Street. So keep those in mind if you were recently or not that recently make a lot of money and you're trying to chase that high, so to speak. And there's a lot of neurology involved in that. And, and I'm as guilty as anyone. I had one of my best weeks ever with the intraday trading. And then the next week I kind of ground, grounded out a little bit or was grinding it out, got chopped up a little bit but mostly survived. And then the next week, bam, I knocked it out of park, the park again. And that was about three weeks ago I did these things. And I've been sort of chasing that high ever since. And if you know a little bit about neurology and dopamine, a loss has twice the impact. And as I'm gonna show you in just a few minutes, you can see where it might even have 10 times the impact of the emotional impact of a gain, okay? So I'm sort of chasing that high, and that's what gets people with uh, with drugs. They, they build up a tolerance to them, and then they start chasing that high or gambling or, or any other bad behavior. Now, as I preach, I often say markets go up and markets go down, and people look at me like a poo in my pants. <laughs> but when markets start going down, and they're buying hope, 
they refuse to accept the fact that the market is going down. I work out with a couple of buddies every day. And on the 23rd, I pointed out, I guess it or probably was on the 24th, I pointed out that, hey, there's this longer term system that I've been following for the last several years and using it to help me make some decisions in the market, not necessarily mechanically, but kind of helping me figure out where we are in this, this, the, the bigger picture cycle, the 30,000 foot view sell signal i said you might want to talk to your guy and he says i did i'm like oh well, what did he say he's yeah he's getting more aggressive now the market is lower and i, I and I'm, I'm pretty sure i rolled my eyes because i tend to wear my feelings on my sleeve and then he says he got a little defensive and says well my guys made me a lot of money so it's like people don't want to believe markets actually go down when they're going down Another friend of mine, he, um, it, I kind of heard through a, a third party that he's been struggling a little bit, and his, actually my wife was already his wife, and my wife said, well, has he talked to Dave? And she said, oh, David won't help him. Well, this is the same guy a while back he told me about this company he was buying because he liked the CEO, and the stock was dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping. And I drew a big blue arrow on the chart. And he said, well, I bought some at this level. And then it dropped a little bit. And I bought some more. Then I bought some more. Then I bought some more. Then I bought some more. And so I drew a big down arrow. And I said, well, this stock is obviously headed lower. And he goes, well, that's in hindsight. And I said, yeah, I'll give you the first one or two buys when it was kind of chopping sideways. But ever since then, you said you averaged down. You bought lower and lower and lower. Well, I checked back in a couple of years later. The stock had continued to drop, became a pink sheet stock. It, it stock, it might even be delisted now. And uh, he said, Yeah, you know, when it was down in like 10 cents or two cents or whatever, he put another 20 grand in or whatever. It's like, okay, whatever. <laughs> so, anyway, long story endless, I checked his accounts and he hasn't logged in, in in over two years. So, he didn't take the courses, he didn't look at my trading service, not that the grand pumba but he could see what I'm buying, how I'm buying, why I'm buying, when I'm shorting, when I'm sitting on my hands, when the market's chopping around. And, you know, there's probably more value in that than anything is just seeing how a trader approaches the market and how what is, is. Anyway, so first thing you need to ask is what's changed in you, okay? So ask yourself, what's changed in me, right? And your life, as I preach, will spill over into your trading. And I was trying to think of a, a very simple example and not something drastic like, um, you know, my parents dying within six months and, you know, all the stuff that went on with that a few years back. But I, I, I thought about one that was fairly recent. My wife had sprained her ankle really, really bad. and. She likes to to exercise, and a lot of times we'll exercise together, go for a walk, 20-mile bike ride, whatever the case is. And she couldn't do those things, and I think that it was making her frustrated that she couldn't. So she was in a bad mood, and actually, you know, I'm in a bad mood. Well, in trading, especially lately, it's been I've been kind of guilty of being grouchy. And, you know, she's like, well, what do you want for supper? Like, I, I could give a shit, you know? <laughs> yeah. Women don't want to hear that, okay? Um but anyway, before I digress too far and get myself in trouble, I think I've thrown a lot of people under the bus tonight. Thank God nobody I know watches my webinars. <laughs> I'm going to be screwed when they do. But anyway, uh, it could your trading in your life can spill over. And so I'm going home grouchy at night on some days, the choppy weeks in between those really good weeks, right? And it's kind of rubbing off on her, and then she's getting a little grouchy, and it's kind of a, a self perpetuating cycle. Negative feedback loop, I think, is the technical term for it. I found this earlier, and this is sort of like my trading that was not going so well at the time. And it's kind of ironic, as I go through these, I could see a few of the mistakes that I made lately. I fat-fingered an order and 
thought I was out, I was supposed to exit 2,000 shares and I only exited 200 shares. And the next day I was having, I wasn't having a good day. I was having an okay day. It was kind of a choppy day. And then I realized that I had 1,800 shares that I should not have had. And that kind of set the tone for that day and kind of mucked me up a little bit. And every trade from that point forward, I was thinking, okay, am I just trading to get out the hole or am I seeing the mother of all opportunities? That was actually early this week. And that kind of mucked me up a little bit. And I'm sure that night I got asked what for what I want to, <laughs> I'm sure that night I got asked what I wanted to eat for supper. And I probably said, I could give a shit. And that got me in trouble. <laughs> Anyway, as I've been saying quite a bit, I just can't stop talking about these you know, perception right now. And a lot of people are dealing with this, especially the buy and hold types. You see a market, it's obviously headed down, okay? But the first little bounce, all of a sudden you think, wow, this is a big long-term uptrend. Thank goodness the correction, the correction is over. And by the way, I hope it's just a correction but it's not looking too good right now and john just pointed out we might have a weekly bow tie so i hadn't looked at that yet now of course if you're short and the market's going up and it goes down a little bit all of a sudden you think that's it that's the top the market is headed straight down and as i've been saying i've been quoting gc Selden a lot lately he wrote a book the psychology of the stock market as i've been saying and no, I'm probably gonna swing my arms and grab a copy. I probably have about six copies later around. I buy a copy, lose it, buy another one, lose it. I have one on Kindle. It's in public domain, so you could download it. But the book's only like four or five bucks, so get, get your copy so you have it. He talks a lot about not being able to see clearly when you have a position in a market. One of the greatest difficulties encountered by the active trader is that of keeping his mind in a balanced and unprejudiced condition when he is heavily committed to either the long or short side of the market. Unconsciously to himself, he permits his judgment to be swayed by his hopes. I own, I wouldn't say a shit ton, but I own a few puts, okay? And those puts have pretty much evaporated since I bought them, okay? And I find myself might be a little bearish right now on that. And I think because I am kind of bearish in general, I got to be really, really careful because these retrace rallies can be a killer. Now, one thing on a personal level you need to ask yourself is are you operating at peak capacity? And you know, far be it for me to give <laughs> lifestyle advice, but I am waking up. I always wake up early. I wake up at 4.55 every morning. And then over the past several months, a couple of buddies of mine have a little makeshift gym and we get together. It's right around the block. We get together every morning. One of the guys was out this week. So the workout was extra hard. <laughs> and And we both were like, today, said not one day this week did i want to work out and and every day i've been looking at my text hoping that he would text me hey look i gotta cancel my wife's not feeling good i'm not feeling good whatever and it was interesting he was feeling the same way so work to have some sort of commitment device and try to balance your life and, and all this stuff so again probably not the best guy to give you this advice but i can tell you I can't imagine how much worse my stress would be if I wasn't lifting weights every morning religiously. Now, regarding losses, I watched some videos that you guys pointed out, you guys in Facebook pointed out, who are here tonight, about uh, that Douglas did you know, on YouTube. And one thing he kind of reiterated over and over again is that a lot of times the trader, when he has a loss, will go back in thinking that if he only he had more knowledge about something, kind of a grail hunt type of thing, he could have completely avoided that loss. Well, there's some truth to that. Sometimes you will have a loss, but 
a lot of times there is something to learn from that. And for instance, I'll go first. I have been kind of super bearish lately, although I have been buying some long ETFs here and there on the balances. But boy, when the market begins to roll over, I always think it's going to be a route lower and I'm going to have one of those 10% weeks like I had a couple of weeks back, you know? And you do that every day, then you lose a percent, a percent a day, percent a day, percent a day, percent a day, 2% a day. And before you know it, you've wiped out all those big gains. But don't always beat yourself up. Sometimes there's not always a lesson and a loss. Now, one thing I was thinking about when I woke up this morning, I know things to think about have changed, is that trading is hard. Steve Pressville in The War of Art, a book I would highly recommend you get. It's about that big and you can read it in one setting easily. And spoiler alert, it's a book about resistance and all resistance you will meet. And, and it's a little play on the, the art of war, obviously. And his point is that from an artist's perspective, you're going to have a lot of resistance. Well, I kind of see the life of a trader as sort of the life of an artist, okay? It's not that stru structured and it's, it's, it's hard for me to kind of flesh it out, but there's a lot of things that I kind of I think are akin to being an artist, and that's why a book that kind of addresses the resistance that the artist will encounter dovetails beautifully in with what we do. And I thought this was brilliant. He said the counterfeit innovator is wildly self-confident. The real one is scared to death. Amen. I'm not going to mention anybody anybody by name, but I'm sure by now you probably know who I'm talking about. I used to get bombarded with these YouTube ads every day. I am the greatest trader in the world. Wow, <laughs> that's a, really, <laughs> you know, okay. And they're they're getting sued for $121 million or 127 million. It's over 100 million for sure. Anyway, turns out they weren't the greatest traders in the world. Now, I don't wanna spit too high in the air because I get my ass handed to me quite often. But the point is, I admit that I do. And the thing I was thinking about this morning is through my, I guess, being blessed in some ways and maybe in some ways making my own luck. I like to think I've made a little bit of my luck, but I've been fortunate enough to travel the world and meet a lot of amazing traders. And I can name drop and I don't want to, but, but it's just, I know people, I just know these people. And anyway, I could think of, I can't think of one of them that's that's cocky. And these are some of the greatest traders in the world. So if you find yourself struggling a little bit, you're alive and that's perfectly normal. Now, the other thing I was thinking about is if your confidence has been shaken, you need to ask yourself, do you have the confidence to begin with? And for instance, with my core methodology, the trend following, the swing trades to the intermediate term trades to hopefully the yearly trades or longer, whatever you call those things, long-term trades, such as ARLP, and we could take a look at that in a second, and CP before that, and there was a couple other big, huge winners. Of course, there were some losers in between, but I feel fairly confident in that methodology. It doesn't mean that it'll get bummed out. It doesn't mean I don't have drawdowns. In fact, Robert... Gray, I always want to say Robert Gray. I think he was a jazz musician. Pretty good, too. Um, anyway, Robert Frey was talking about the fact that you're nearly always in a drawdown. Greg Morris, if you're thinking about the long side, Greg Morris said markets only make new highs 4% of the time. So you might be in a drawdown 90-something percent of the time, and it can be tough. But I do have confidence in this methodology I've been trading for almost 30 years, but I do try other things. And as I've talked about the last year or two, I've, I've done some intraday ETF trading, some e-mini trading and things like that. And the crypto, the crypto is a little bit more like the core methodology. So that's sort of different and that that makes sense to me and I could trade that. 
But a lot of this intraday stuff, I don't have that 30 years worth of trading. And so when the volatility changes, maybe I'm a little slow to adjust to that. And I don't have that confidence. So the first thing I would tell you to do is make sure you have the confidence to begin with. If you're trading stocks and crypto and sectors and E-minis and ETFs and Forex and anything else out there, and you're fairly new to all this, you're probably trying to do too much, especially if you're trading off a big picture technical analysis. If you're a methodology surfing, you're trading breakouts, you're trading pullbacks, you're trading the system du jour, or you're trading a big picture head and shoulder top or head and shoulder bottom or double bottom, double top, whatever the case may be you're probably doing too much. And if you're day trading some combination of these on top of all that, technically you don't really have that confidence just yet. Now, getting back to a loss, and I borrowed this from Douglas, and I think he, I'm not sure exactly how he said it, but he talks about the fact that a loss is more than just a loss it kind of brings back those bad memories. And I've lost my cool with my children here and there. My wife lost, has lost her cool with my children here and there, her children, my children, whatever. You know, the example I give is like my daughter was supposed to, and I don't have told the story a thousand times, but my daughter was supposed to give the dog water. She didn't want to get up from watching TV or whatever. It's like, if you don't give the dog water before, when I wake up tomorrow, if that bowl is still dry, you're not going to your fun thing that you're going to do, the uh, party that cried or whatever. And my wife literally cried because she had to take that away from her. And she totally lost her cool when she, when she had to follow through on the punishment. And to the outside eye, it's like, well, what's wrong with you? She just forgot to give the dog water. But it was every other time she ever forgot to give the dog water. So a loss has all the losses passed. It's kind of like, oh man, here we go again. So there's a there's a really tough psychology with it. And as I said earlier, it's been proven that a negative emotion is twice the impact of a positive emotion. And in trading, and one of you guys in the group once said, you heard it was 10 times, and I don't know if it's directly related to trading, but anyway, long story endless, I think that it might be more than two times simply because you do tend to attach every negative thing that's happened to happen to you. It's kind of like, okay, here we go again. Anyway, as I would say lately, markets all in your head. A couple of quick Douglas things just want to throw out. I've been talking about these a lot lately. The markets have no absolutely no power or control of you, no expectation of your behavior, and no regard to your welfare. Boy, I tell you, I've been feeling that quite a bit lately I had, like I said, just had a couple of good weeks out of the last six weeks, top of the world. And then I get my ass handed to me. And it's like, this market has no regard for your welfare. In fact, you can't control and manipulate the markets and the markets have absolutely no power or control over you. Then the responsibility for what you perceive, it's interesting, it says what you perceive. And we talked a lot about perception lately. What is, is, right? And for your resulting behavior resides only in you. The only one thing you can control is yourself. Well, heavy is the head that wears a crown. You can't blame it on other people. And a lot of us, none of people, none of the people are here, right? But a lot of us have spent our whole lives blaming other people for stuff that has gone wrong. And probably in nine out of ten of those times, it was the fault of those other people. <laughs> And as I often say, once you start quoting Douglas, you can't stop. If you can put on a trade without hesitation, take it off without emotional discomfort, you have accepted the risk. This haunts me every time I am screaming F-bombs in my office. By the way, on a good day, I'll go the entire day without screaming, without screaming. Yeah, without screaming an F-bomb, without dropping one F-bomb. But when I'm getting chewed up a lot, I, I can tell that I'm out of phase. I'm not in that state of flow. What's this? Uh, Mihaly Chizuz. Thank you, Haley. He wrote a book called Flow, which is pretty good. His name's about that long. If I could see it, I could I could pronounce it, but it's toward to Chizuz. It's like his first name is part of his last name. 
anyway, good stuff. He's got a couple of YouTube videos too. You might want to check out. Oh, there's more Mark. <laughs> As I often say, essentially what you fear is not the markets, but rather your inability to do what you need to do without hesitation. And that's sometimes a position gets away from you and you just, it's it can become a very stressful thing. And going into it, you may have not fully accepted the risk. Well, here's the good news with all this. You know, I'm sitting here throwing all these problems at you and all these issues at you, but the good news is you know what you're doing wrong. And often, as I said, I'd nausea them. Somebody will contact me and says, Dave, I need a little help. I'm like, okay, how the hell am I going to figure out what this guy or gal is doing wrong? So the first thing I do is ask them, and they tell me. <laughs> and, you know, it's like, don't do that, <laughs> you know? And I know, easier, easier said than done. So I'll go first. Like I just said a minute ago, admission of guilt. I fat figured a, a, a 200 share order to exit versus a 2000 share order to exit. And I had scalped a little bit, truth be told. And this is how, boy, I tell you, here's a lesson here, you know, at my expense, at, at a lot of my expense, right? It was a trade that's really not, doesn't really pay off that big. It's something I do in the last few minutes of the market. I call it race to finish, race to the finish. When I see something like all of a sudden imploding or whatever, I'll just dog pile on right before the close. And usually if it doesn't work, I could sweep it under the rug. And if it does work, I could pick up a hundred bucks or whatever, just a, just kind of chump change, you know, pizza party money. <laughs> But in this case, I forgot to close it out, close out all of it. And you know, all those little scalps I've probably done over the last five years or four years or three years or whatever, at least a couple of years, you know, or evaporate overnight. Anyway, so that's one of my mistakes. Uh, I can think of a few more, but if I tell you everything, then you, you won't be that impressed. But you guys at the Facebook group knew that know this, like uh, I've forgotten about Fed days on more than one occasion. Anyway, somebody had contacted me recently and we're supposed to talk, but we both seem to be, correction, I seem to be too busy lately to um, to catch up to things. And I plan on doing this maybe this weekend if if uh, everything allows. But one of the things in saying that he wanted to talk with me, he said that he, he sees the setup, he puts on too much size, and then it begins to get away from him, and then he lets the stock get away from me, him, and that's the main issue. Well, I mean, the answer is don't do that. You know, and, and I know, easier said than done. And the size thing kind of rings uh, clear with me. And I think if you watch some of my older videos, especially those the newer quick clips that have been parsing out on YouTube, you'll notice that in some cases I talked about some of my biggest days or when I'm trying to get a small size. And that, that big week that I had a couple of weeks back and the, and the medium week I had in between that, like a five or six percent a week was I was trading at about half the size I would normally trade because the volatility of the market is so whack. So get your volatility right. And even though it doesn't seem like you're putting on that much shares, at least your losses will be in control. And if you end up with a route day, okay, the market implodes, SPs go down 150 points or whatever, then even if you have on just a small share size and you're short obviously you're going to do really 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 well and you won't get chewed up as much so the good news again is is you know what you're doing wrong another one of those comes from dalio's book principles and you know it's painful it's painful and and i'm going to talk about documenting and journey journaling and one of the problems with the documenting and journaling is it makes you realize that a lot of times as a trader, you are Einstein's definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different outcome. But when these things happen and you write down another one of those, and I just abbreviate it in my trading journal, then my goal after that is to document it and then even possibly create a procedure 
so that I don't do it again. For instance, the forgetting about the Fed day, I need to put an alarm on Wednesdays or something to say, hey, check to make sure it's not a Fed day or ahead of time, check for Fed days and have alarm go off if it is. Now, I can't emphasize this enough. Document, 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 document how you're feeling, document what you're doing. Like I said, it gnaws them quite a bit lately. One of the problems that I found was I was making trades, walk, I'd walk to my office and make a trade almost religiously and then get my ass handed to me on nine out of 10 of those trades. And then by accident, I read in one of these books and I'd reread, I've heard it before. And it's probably, I think Gladwell talks about some of these things that I've seen in other places too, where the reason I'm making those trades is because I was probably hangry walking out of my office. Usually it's around lunchtime, right? And I'm feeling pretty good walking back in because my blood sugar's back up and I'm feeling good about everything. And oh, look how pretty this trade is. Let's take the trade. And the, the Gladwell or whoever wrote about it first, and I apologize for not giving credit where credit is due, but I've seen it in more than one place, was talking about judges who give more lenient sentences after lunch. Well, that's because they're full. So if you ever get convicted of a crime, <laughs> see if you could postpone sentencing to after lunch and you'll get a lenient a more lenient sentence. Journal. Every morning I wake up, I write three handwritten pages. These are like the notes for tonight, but that's what it looks like. And I just write what's in my head. You know, as I said before, sometimes it's a great, it's a trading system I want to test or whatever. Right here, so I've got another one of those where I realize what I did. Um, and, and this, another one of those is is when when I have a windfall profit in a stock, and I, I identified this, and I'm mad at myself, but when I have a windfall profit in a stock, I tend to fall in love with that stock and think I can go in and day trade it or trade around that position, and I end up losing money. And it's a thousand here, a thousand there, it begins to add up after a while, and it makes me harder. It makes it harder. You know, one thing I didn't realize is I, I might not want to do that in every account because it sure is kind of fun to show you. Hey, I just got into stock here, bought a couple thousand shares. That's all, whatever, because it was a lower price stock, whatever. And uh, flipped out a thousand here, flipped out a little bit more, taking some profits. And I've been riding it for, the, for three years. And, and here's the trade. See how easy it is, right? And I realized that, boy, I just mucked that up. <laughs> anyway, so I wrote in my notes another one of those. And hopefully, as my wife says, when I screw up something, you'll do that once. I'm not allowed to tell her that, though. <laughs> Here's the thing, you need to see the forest for the trees. I've been like this in my screens way too much. Every little sell off of make, here we go. I'm gonna dog pile in on the short side. I'm gonna get super aggressive. This market's going to hell in a handbasket. And a couple, couple of times it has done that, but maybe I'm guilty of chasing that high a little bit. So, yeah, there's been some route days here and there, and that's where I absolutely print money. And maybe it's a holy grail hunt, but I need to figure out for the intraday stuff how to only trade on those route days. And as we're going live tonight, I was thinking one thing I do, and I'll show it to you in the charts, is I, I, I have a little percent indicator that tells me the range that an ETF has moved in the day. I'm wondering what would happen if I just, you know, lately I've been letting them get to at least 50% most days. I'm wondering if you let it get to 100%, how often does it go from 100% of the range to much higher? And I'll show you that in the chart and hopefully that'll make a little more sense. All right, getting back to any questions or thoughts or comments on psychology and you know what I, what I wanna come across as tonight is, is I have emotions, I'm a very emotional guy. I do get stressed out a lot of times with trading. When I'm when I'm trading well, it, it's almost stress free. It actually gives me energy. When I'm trying to force things to happen, it, it takes away energy from me, and can be very frustrating. And I just want to let you know that we all go through these ups and downs. Okay, getting back to the markets where bad things happen. It was baleo i can't see his name in my i think it's b-i-l-e-l-o or something like that and gayar did a paper that i i probably got it from uh, david keller because i saw he he referenced where bad things happen recently 
And their whole point was below the 200-day moving average, bad things happen in the market. And we can look at that 200-day moving average. And one thing that that led me to look at a few years back was the 10% line, the buy line. Okay. So this green line in here is 90% of the 50-week closing high. This is for the TFM system. And when a market loses more than 10% of its value, a lot of times, not all the time, but a lot of times, really bad things can happen. And really bad things happen often enough that you need to pay attention for when that happens. So you can see back here, 30 and 40% losses in some of these bear markets. 2009, obviously 50% loss. And you know, this little pandemic thing, everybody just, everybody these buy and hope people held through it, but that was a lot uglier than it looks. And if you held through it, you know, I, I watched a friend of mine, it tormented the hell out of him just following this thing lower. I mean, if he, not that I'm the grand pool Bob, but he could have read my column and saw that I was, I had a sell signal and was not looking to buy anything. Maybe that would have got him out a little earlier. But this thing, living through this, this thing was just imploding. And even though I was trying to short or probably shorting a lot on the way down, I have to go and look at my records. It does, it did scare me that this thing was imploding. And I felt bad for a lot of people. But anyway, you can see 30 something percent drop during the pandemic. And then right now we're at about 11% when the snapshot was taken. So not the end of the world, obviously just yet. By the way, here's the other thing that's kind of great, and I was telling a buddy of mine this, so, who I'm pretty sure he's a buy and hold kind of guy, but I was telling this earlier today, the good news is markets just don't go straight down, usually, and I talked about that a couple of weeks back where you know, I learned this from Greg, and then I actually started counting the days. If you count the weeks in this particular case, you count the weeks before this thing actually hits, it's weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks before it hits. It usually doesn't hit too quickly. Now, the pandemic was a bit of a, a extreme. It did hit within a couple of weeks, but it did bounce significantly before the official, I'm sorry, it did bounce significantly before the, the market went into a, a bit of a um, tailspin. So I've been showing this slide a lot lately. I inverted the scale. So this shows you percent losses. And my point is that bad things happen, as you can see, once you get below 10%. So once a market loses 10% of its value, not every time, thank God, but quite often some ugly things can happen. And so obviously 2009, market lost half of its value. And then when was this? 2000 was nothing to sneeze at, especially with the NASDAQ. NASDAQ lost 77% of its value. And then, of course, Great Depression, 75, 80% loss or whatever that was back then. And, of course, during a pandemic, 30-something percent slide. That's significant, right? And percentage-wise, that's it's well, you had 10%, then you've got 33 total. But if you look at the percent from there to there, that's even bigger than 30%. And hopefully that made sense. Just like the point I'm trying to make is the NASDAQ lost half of its value, then it lost half of its value again. Okay, so I haven't done the math on the pandemic slide, but it is significant. Now, the point I want to make here is just because you haven't lived through something doesn't mean it, that it can't happen. I got recommended a, a, a video by, uh, what's his name, Dalio, from from Principles, and he's Principles of, of um, Changing World Order, I think is what it was, and that's one of the videos that'll scare the hell out of you. Now, he's looking over thousands of years or a thousand years at least, but bad things can happen. And then if 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 we lose our reserve currency status, not to confuse issue with facts, it's going to be pretty ugly. And I've been paying a, a careful attention to the dollar based on that and some other things because we just printed 80%, we, pre we presented 80% more dollars over the last two years than have been in circulation every year prior to that. So the, the fiat printing machine just gets cranked up. And that's not always a bad thing right away, but eventually it can be. All right, one of you guys was talking about using Landry Light 
to stay on the right side of the market. It's something I've talked about quite a bit. And you were talking about simple versus exponential moving averages. And use whatever you like. And you, you don't have to just pigeonhole yourself into one thing. The 50-day moving average came up. And in the TFM 10% system, I use a 50-week simple moving average, okay, which I guess would be 250 on a daily. But the reason I use a simple moving average in that was I don't I didn't want it to necessarily catch up the price too quickly. I did want a little lag. So sometimes when you're designing a system, or if you're just trying to hold on to a market longer term, it's okay to have a little lag of the system and use a simple moving average. Okay. One thing great about the 50 simple moving average is that it's a well-watched moving average when it comes to the markets. But you can see we have the 50 here. Now remember, Landry Light is simply, if a low is greater than the moving average, we count that as day one. If it continues to be greater than the moving average, we just count the days. And I display them as a histogram, or had them programmed as a histogram, is more accurate. <laughs> And that is to, and this is built into Metastock. I think it might be called Dave Light in Metastock, but it's built into Metastock. So if you own Metastock, you have this indicator. It might be called Dave Light before I called it Landry Light then. Um, one of you guys, I think it was Mike Peterson, gave me the, said call it Landry Light, which I thought was great. Anyway, lows graded moving average. This is not the magnitude. I've tricked a lot of people on the back end of my website when we talk about trends. It does not measure from here to here, okay? It just tells you the number of days the market is above the moving average, the lows are above, and on the downside, the number of days the highs are below. So again, as long as it's green, you wanna be mostly long, as long as it's red, you wanna be mostly short. Now, here's the 30 EMA, which is my favorite EMA, I know you wanna party with me, <laughs> to use, especially with Landry Light, even though I do look at the 50, like I just said, in the overall market at least. But as a general statement, a 30 could do a really good job with the Landry Light of keeping the right side of the market. Now we did get a little choppy in here, but notice that it's chopping back and forth too. And one thing I've kind of toyed with is maybe counting the number of days of Landry Light. The, the 220, by the way, EMA breakout system or a 330 EMA breakout systems would have been looking at lately, especially in like crypto. You're looking for two lows above the moving average, and then you look to get long above those two bars, okay? So the entry would have been right here. It works incredibly well in a trending market. I wouldn't rush out and trade in something like S&Ps, which tend to be choppy. But longer term, paying attention to the green and red, Tarzan speak green good, Tarzan speak red bad, <laughs> can help to keep you on the right side of the market. So that's a 30 EMA. Now, if you back the chart way out with a 30, and this is where I get excited. I don't know I'm a nerd, but so what? I think in the Bible it says the geeks will inherit the geeks will inherit the earth. I'm pretty sure it's what it says. Anyway, notice back here, lots and lots of green with the market do went up. Okay. Pandemic slide, lots and lots of red with the market do went down. Lots and lots and lots and lots of green, almost. The entire run up, little red here, obviously, a little questionable markets, okay? More green, and now what do we have? Quite a bit of red, okay? So maybe that's a red herring. <laughs> All right, we're going to jump into live charts here in just one second. There's really nothing new to say in crypto except that it's now it's it's been at, well, it's been in a bear market forever, but now it's really in a bear market. You heard me talk a lot tonight about the Facebook group. I have a group for trend traders. And I think everybody here tonight is a member and I appreciate you attending tonight live too. Thank you. But we have a really good group and, it, and usually I show a post of the week and I'll jump to the group to show you. There were so many good posts this week. I really didn't really want to single anyone out because it would slight the other people, but you guys have been super active lately and I've been jumping in too and it's been fantastic. So you have to be a gold member that keeps the riffraff out. Okay, let's jump to the live charts. Let's start with crypto. 
And before we do that, let me just show you the group real quick. So here's the group. Like I said, we've been super active as of late. You can see lots and lots of stuff. And this is where the, the Landry Light conversation comes in. See my little Tarzan speak right here. We were talking about the Landry Light and stuff. And then Sean was pointing out some really interesting stuff about things that are happening that's kind of uh, Russia kind of through the pond, through the uh, rock in the water. I guess we kind of threw the rock in the water by shutting down Russia on a bunch of stuff. And and that's starting to reverberate throughout the system. And that can get a little scary at times. You don't want to confuse the issue with facts, but it doesn't hurt to be alive to that. Anyway, great group. I I love you guys so much. I really do. And girls, thanks for your participation this week. This is probably the most post ever. And I want to thank you guys sincerely for that. Again, if you want to be in the group, Dave Landry's Trend Traders is a group. Tomorrow I'm going to get 100 requests and I'm going to have to turn you all away. You have to be, unless you're a gold member of Dave Landry, you can go to my website to find out more about that. Anyway, let me sh let's jump to crypto real quick and then we'll jump out to the, oh, you want to take a look at the Landry light real quick? I'm sorry, the, um, the bow ties. Let me see if I got a, I think I have a, a deal for that. So let's take a look at the bow tie real quick and we'll put the proper order in with them, okay? So this is the S&P 500, obviously. Let's take a look at a weekly. And John was pointing out that we have a weekly bow tie. I don't see it just yet. We have the, it's getting there, it's close, okay? So we'll take a look at it in, um, yeah, thanks for reminding me about the bow tie. I really appreciate that. During the pandemic, it was a little slow to catch up because everything slid so fast, but you, you want to look at more than one system. And you also want to look at the net-net price movement, which is kind of baked into the TFM 10% system to see what you are, okay? So... If the market is 10% off its highs, its 50-week highs, you need to become a little bit concerned. But the bow ties, especially if you look at proper order, okay, it's green when the 10 is greater than the 20. The 20 is exponential, by the way. And the 20 is greater than 30, okay? So 10 greater than 20, 20 greater than 30, it's green. So it's been green for 80-something days, okay? And oh, look, it went to zero. So it went to zero as of today, okay? And the reason it went to zero is because the 10 is now less than the 20 and the 10 is also now less than the 30, okay? So just another really simple, some of the simple stuff that I look at, it just amazes me at how well it works. And what's amazing is when you're in the middle of it, it doesn't seem to work that well, you know? But then after it's all said and done, you're like, holy moly, that worked out pretty good. But you can see, look way back here, late 2000s, you had mostly green. You had some iffy spots in here. And this was a little uglier than it might look on this big longer term chart. And I think I pointed that out quite often. But it did kind of turn, it did turn red or mostly red. Yellow means it's in between, they're starting to cross over. So what's going to happen over the next couple of days is, or next week or so, it's going to start turning yellow down here, okay? Once we complete probably this week, this will start turning yellow, meaning that moving averages are crossing. So you take a look at this, you go way back in time, you know, look at this bear market, I feel like tiny elbows, it's huge, okay? This was 2008, okay? You got the bow tie way, way, way up here. Okay, usually, usually it's not that foretelling. Usually, you got to wait for the market to start kind of really selling off to get that bow tie. But thank you, John, for pointing that out. If we get a if we get a bow tie this early into the cycle, that's probably not a good thing. Okay, but I appreciate. Thanks for bringing that up. 
I really do appreciate that. All right, let's take a look at crypto real quick, and then we'll um, we'll hop out into stocks. If you guys any any crypto pairs you want to look at, I know this it's mostly in a bear market. The ones that I have in orange, I am short. Don't tell anyone, but I I, I do have a tiny amount of Bitcoin hodled, and it's killing me. Believe me, it's killing me. I am long this AXC just because it's going up. I have a very small position here. I trust these SHYT shit coins about as far as I can throw. <laughs> and I'm mostly short shit coins. I'm short YFI, SOL, DAO, okay? And I don't want to make it look like I just print money because I was short. I think I was short Luna not that long ago. And I got my butt tax handed to me. But there's not a whole lot of excitement in crypto right now. Bitcoin's kind of all over the place. Chop it back and forth. It does seem to find support when it sells off. I think I think there's a lot of people waiting in the wings. I listened to Michael Saylor today. It's always a problem when I do that because I become a super bull. <laughs> and, you know, he lays out some really good cases. If uh, some of these countries with uh, really crappy currencies put 5% of their reserves into Bitcoin, I know it's kind of like if my aunt had well, you know, she'd be my uncle, but I guess nowadays that doesn't matter, does it? I'm, I'm going to digress. Sorry. Anyway, you can see a lot of red in here. Let's just put them alphabetical. And as I often say, the 30 EMA, look at that, is your best friend. Pair after pair after pair after pair or below the 30 EMA, okay? So it's nothing to do, okay? If you didn't do anything or didn't know anything about trading, don't buy anything that's below the 30 EMA. I just paid for your webinar. You're welcome. And let's just take a look at the stronger pairs and see what's happening. Lots and lots of red. There are a few here you can see that are moving up. That one looks okay. XHV, I don't know how liquid it is. Let's take a look at a few of these. But really, even look at the strongest ones in here, it's just not a whole lot to get excited about. Now, I know trading view just rolled over, so this is just the beginning of the day, so to speak. So maybe you need to look at the last couple of days or just go through all of them. But most of these things, as you can see, are living up to their name. All right, no questions on crypto. Let's hop into the overall market. And one thing I want to show you real quick is. One thing I've done over recent years with the intraday stuff is to make sure I'm not getting too caught up in a choppy day. So what I did was I had this little indicator. I have it in Thinkorswim, I think. I mean, I know I do. And then I have it programmed here. And it's just looking at the... And I think this is supposed to be lab D in this one or lab U, whatever you want, you want to look at. So it just looks at the range compared to the last 10 days. Okay. And this is the true range, high minus low versus the last 10 days of average true range. And I'll be happy to give you the formula. And my thinking is if it's less than 50% of the range, you might not want to be trading that pair. And that in and of itself might keep you out of trouble. And you can see this one was only 52%. It was a little gap involved. So you could argue that. But maybe, just maybe, you only want to trade these things when they're at least 50% or more. Something impossible to keep you out of trouble. Let's take a look at the overall market. We'll start with the NASDAQ since we're here. NASDAQ Composite had one little kiss of the 30 EMA, okay? Since January. How crazy is that? Stupid, simple, little moving average. Stupid, simple, little exponential moving average. And Landry Light, highs less than a moving average, except this little kiss, and that sometimes you could actually look to short these kisses with a few caveats, wait for, wait for it to start going back down. That's a pretty nice trend. Now try to ride it. Good luck. Uh, Bill Dunn said riding a trend is like riding a bouncing Bronco. Amen. My brother from another mother. 
That's a P500. Had a few little kisses of its, or two little kisses of its EMA, 30 EMA. But notice, nice little downtrend attack there. The dollar, something I'm watching quite a bit. One of these days, the dollar is going to get killed. I hope it's not for a long, long time, but I am paying attention to what's happening in the dollar. <laughs> Don't listen to Michael Saylor too much. Note so. Gold. Let's give it up a little bit in here, but obviously, which way gold? Which way is gold headed? Looks like it's going up to me, but you know me, I'm just trying to find more on. The rusty's kind of interesting. Rusty's just kind of chopping around in here. The trend does remain down, and if you back the chart way out, you can see that yeah, it's still in a downtrend, and boy, it's got a long ways to go if we take out this little bit of a double bottom. A lot of people are like, "Hey, look, we got a double bottom in the chart. Yay! I'm telling my friends." Well. Settle down, Beavis. Let's not get too excited about a little bit of support down here at 188. I would rather pay attention to that level and see if it gets taken out and then get concerned. The upside, you're gonna have time to get long. Don't worry about that. But for now, I'd pay attention to those levels. Energy's doing pretty damn good in here, as you can see, a little kiss of that 30 EMA. Almost kissed it right here. Look how beautiful that is. Nice little thrust higher. Lots of land your light, little pullback at EMA, nice little thrust higher, pullback, thrust higher. This this market is acting very nicely. It's acting well, especially since it's a commodity-related market. Speaking of commodity-related markets, take a look at the metals and mining. Thrust, pullback, thrust, a little bit of a TKO move yesterday, and now pushing higher again. Oh, by the way, speaking of metals and mining, we've been long ARLP forever. Forever. And Let's see if I could tell you when we got long this one. We got long ARLP in January of 2021. So it's only been a month, only a month, a year and three and a half months. That's my goal in every trade is to hold them about 10 years. So January... Where's January? This is January 2022, January 2021. Good Lord. Has it been that long? Sweet. Okay, we got long back here. Lo and behold, look at that. I'm just, this is a great thing about teaching, right? I learn as I go. Nice lander light here. We got a nice little pullback to the 30 EMA. It doesn't get much prettier than that. Look at that, for, especially for a, a, a coal stock, right? Now, this is why we don't exit window to market top somewhere in February, somewhere around here, okay? And now this stock is going on to make new highs. And this might just save our buttocks in the portfolio. We only had two stocks coming into the slide, but it's kind of nice to be able to just follow the system. Remember earlier I was saying it's easier. I don't want to say it's easy, but it's easier for me to follow my system I've been following for 30 years than it is to do some of this new stuff. Here's one thing I can't wrap my hat around, consumer non-durables and to a lesser extent the foods, but even the foods are imploding in here. These are defensive areas, okay? You would think that they would be stabilized or going up. Well, I don't know, maybe people are buying less food. My, my wife used to send me to the store to buy meat because she couldn't, because I don't look at prices, you know? But now I'm starting to notice prices. And anyway, it's like she just, I was, getting ready to get ready for this presentation and she walked in the bathroom and she said uh, she goes look i'm gonna go get your corny asada from the the mexican restaurant because i couldn't bring myself to buy you know the extra chicken breast or whatever i only bought so many chicken breasts and, and when i put them in the soup i'm looking at it going like that's not enough for big dave so so i get a, a corny asada so it ended up anyway where are you going with that, Dave? Um, the point I'm trying to make is maybe people are buying less food than they used to be, okay? And I know lately my wife's been defrost. You know, it's like this. Uh, it's like on Monday she goes, "Why'd you defrost all that food?" I'm like, "I didn't defrost any food." It's like you must have cleaned the fridge out after a couple of cocktails on Saturday night, <laughs> you know? So anyway, we, we've been eating out of our fridge, so maybe that's what's going on, and and that'll eventually catch up, right? Just pick a chart, you know, throw a dart, pick a chart, throw a dart, except for energies, defense, metals and mining. That's pretty much it, okay? They're all headed lower. 
at least for now, check back off. Then there's that was manufacturing, there's MNC, retail. If you you got any stocks, let me know. Let me know now because we'll shut it down here in just a few minutes. I'm nearly done. Retail downtrend software. Look at that. Damn, not doing so hot in here. Let's uh let's take a look at Amazon. Just for SNG. Yeah, Amazon's really not doing that great either, huh? Looks like a downtrend to me. I like that one, John. We'll get to that. Tesla. I got a few clients have some hot positions in some of these, and they've been peeling them off. Yeah, that's that's pretty much a downtrend too. Although they said that the the secret to the gas crunch is to go, everybody buy a Tesla. <laughs> okay. Well, if everybody bought a Tesla, then they're gonna have to fire up the coal-powered plants to power all those Teslas. I know, don't confuse the issue with facts. I am glad to see, believe it or not, I am glad to see the new energies coming online like that. The problem is it takes a while for that technology to come to fruition. The good news is at least they're doing it. You know, I mean, if they didn't, if they just sat around and says, well, it's not worthwhile, we're, we're, we're getting a lot of our electricity from coal and everybody that gets electric car, it's just more coal. You got to shovel into the uh, furnace to burn to make that electricity. I know, some, I'm gonna get some hate mail for this. <laughs> I don't know, it just seems so simple to me. Why am I confusing this issue with facts? But yeah, I think, I think it'd be great if we went more electric. You know, the problem is, if you do all the math on the environmental impact, you've got, you could drive a gas car a long, long time before you break even on all that. Uh, where were we? John, yeah, this looks good, man. Nice little Landry light higher, nice little breakouts, okay? I, it's been catching my eye quite a bit. I'd actually like a little bit deeper pullback, but it, I think it looks good enough to go after. I really do. And I think somebody had emailed me and said they played a bow tie here, but it's a bow tie at high levels. I prefer just a, a one. All right, David, how you doing, buddy? FCX. Yeah, FCX looks okay. Um, Free, Freeport MacMoron. Um, it's a little wide and loose. But I can't argue with you on that one. Metals and energies to a little bit lesser extent can be pretty choppy. Metals can be pretty choppy. So I might make an exception and say that looks pretty good. I think there's some other metals out there that are a little bit cleaner. But yeah, Freeport back moron is really, really, yeah, CNX, that's the one I was trying to think of. Thank you. Thank you, uh, John. But um, yeah, FCX is never a normal chart. I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. Liquidity. Yeah, absolutely. You're looking for liquidity. Um, I know you do a lot of a lot of things that involve liquidity. You know, maybe uh, you could look at uh, calls or something like that, or there might be some sort of a uh, little bit more advanced transaction you're doing. Absolutely. But yeah, CENX would be a, a, a good example of, a, of a, a, a stock that's trending really well, or, or metal, I should say, that's trending well. It it actually it's a pretty deep pullback. I'd actually like even more of a pullback, but yeah, C and X looks good. I think this one's been on a Landry list. If not, it's because I actually was looking for a deeper pullback. But absolutely, uh, high five on that one. To I think John gave it to me. Yeah, good job, John. Yeah, David FCX. It's 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 a choppy chart, but it's certainly going higher. Yeah, yeah, I know you you do a lot of things where you need liquidity. All right, any more? I know we, we cover a lot of this stuff in Facebook daily. Since we started the group, we don't um, the uh, question and answers, which is fine. And, you know, here's the thing. This is not a closed webinar. This is open to everyone, okay? So if you want to join us, if you're watching this recording you want to join us, please do. And bring questions. All right, just going once, going twice. All right, I want to thank everybody for coming. As usual, I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. It looks like the numbers are getting bigger and bigger each week, which is exciting for me. Everybody have a great weekend. We'll talk to you now and then. Everyone else, I'll see you tomorrow in Facebook. And may the trend be with you. Thank you. Cheers.